And I'm Grant Walker. Competition for Transrail on the Cook Strait Ferry Run came a major step closer today. The straight runner arrived in Wellington overnight and it's hoped that the new service on the Mana to Picton Run will begin next week. Capital City's Alistair Wilkinson has this report. The sleek lines of the straight runner turn heads at Queen's Wharf today. The latest Cook Strait Ferry is fresh from Fremantle. It's moored on the waterfront for maritime safety checks before beginning its mana to Picton service three times a day from Tuesday. The ferry's brand new, and while it's substantially smaller than its competitors, owners say it's perfect for the journey. The scantlings or frames within the vessel, in fact, are the heaviest that they put into a vessel of this type, of this design, and this is the sixth that SBF shipbuilders have built uh, to the same design. Uh, she is therefore stronger, she, uh, we believe, therefore, more suited to the Cook Strait run than any similar or sister ships. The design is simple, with upper deck sides that fold back on sunny days. Owners say the route is carefully chosen. The biggest advantage, I guess, is A, it's the shortest uh, and the straightest line. But more important than that, from an environmental point of view, uh, we've got a sound of water that the wash is going to dissipate through and uh, the effect on the shore will be virtually nothing. Fares are highly competitive, with passengers paying $35 for the trip to Picton. Of course, the backpacker market, uh, the young folk who uh, have limited budgets, and anybody else with limited budgets come to that. But those who don't have a vehicle wish to cross the straits and enjoy the sounds, Picton, Blenheim area. After dispute over the Mana terminal site, today preparations were well underway, with big plans for the area. There'll be restaurants, uh, small marine surfacing facilities for the likes of outboard motors and so on, um, boat sales facilities, and of course our operation. There'll also be uh, a few um, flats and, and uh, ownership apartments that will be erected within the complex as well. From Tuesday morning, Wellingtonians will get their opportunity to experience a new alternative in Cook Strait travel. Alastair Wilkinson, News at 7. And still on the water, the last of the Wellington anti-nuclear flotilla to return from Muraroa arrived back in port this morning. Veronica Lysart was there to meet New Zealand Maid. New Zealand Maid was safely in their heads by mid-morning, and after three and a half months at sea, the Tucker family are happy and relieved to be at home. We didn't really feel like we'd finished the trip till we got back here, so, um, yeah. A lot of friends here, a lot of people to catch up with, an awful lot of people to thank, a lot of gear to return. For the kids, it was time to catch up with friends. For the adults, the trip was definitely worthwhile. I don't think we can just sit back and think, OK, we've done it now, and this is it. But I think, um, certainly think that world, world opinion has been more polarised by the action that's been taken over the French testing. I think there's a lot more people now thinking about the issue who may otherwise have, uh, have been leaving it up to, uh, uh, up to Greenpeace. Barbara and John say they couldn't have made the trip without the support of New Zealanders, including refuelling at sea from the Navy ship, the Tui. In front of the, uh, the French warships and helicopters, uh, each of the four boats that left, left Wellington uh, and arrived together uh, were lined up and one at a time at four knots. We had the hoses passed aboard. Um, it, it was an indication really that it was the whole of New Zealand. It wasn't just a few, a few hippies and, uh, and protesters, but uh, we had government backing. Um, we had the backing of the people of New Zealand. Barbara says there was a pretty eerie feeling at the atoll, particularly after the other boats had left and they were still under French surveillance. Warships were pretty much always in sight and if, if the yachts all got together and were doing something near the line, the, the warships would steam round and round and round. They'd get quite agitated, you know, they're quite anxious about what was going on. The French are expected to carry out two more tests in the Pacific before signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The New Zealand Peace Flotilla hope for now their protest is finished. Veronica Lysart, News at 7. In court news, convicted double murderer John Barlow has today been jailed for 14 years. He was found guilty of the murders of Jean and Eugene Thomas at their offices on the terrace last year. However, Barlow was only found guilty on the third attempt. The juries in two earlier trials failed to reach a verdict. Inside, John Barlow, leaving court for the final time. His wife had nothing to say. But his brother, Hugh Barlow, did. Obviously an excessively long sentence for an innocent person. Eugene and Jean Thomas were killed 22 months ago. 
Now, relative Hewitt Anderson says the family isn't concerned about the length of the sentence. I really have no further comments to make on that. Under laws changed two years ago, judges can now order a minimum period offenders must serve before they can be paroled, if the case is exceptional. Today, Crown Prosecutor Ken Stone asked for more than the 10 years that's mandatory for murder. He wanted Barlow to serve 20. Barlow's lawyer, John Billington, argued there was nothing exceptional about murder, that increasing the sentence would not serve as a deterrent to others. But Justice Nazer told Barlow he had no doubt that Barlow was a very dangerous man who deserved to be locked away for a long time. He said he accepted that this was a serious and exceptional case. He then sentenced Barlow to a period of 14 years jail before he would be eligible for parole. Lawyers think the judge got it right. That's a fair sentence and more and more the power will be used. But the story of John Barlow will have another chapter, says his lawyer. Yeah, the appeal will be filed next week. That appeal probably won't reach court until early next year. Tough times for university graduates. Hundreds of students attended graduation ceremonies at Victoria this week. And while graduate unemployment doesn't appear to be the problem it's been in past years, student debt appears to be more crippling than ever. Paula Day Tom has more. It's that time of year again as thousands of varsity graduates up and down the country fold up their gowns and head out into the workforce. Recent figures show there's many more of them than before. More of finding jobs and getting paid better starting salaries. Over the past decade, the number of graduates has nearly doubled. In 1986, just under 10,000 people graduated. By the end of next year, nearly 20,000 more students will have a degree. And the universities are happy with the success rate. Not a great deal of difficulty. People are still having to sell themselves and, and make a pitch for getting a job. But what I understand from the um, information from employers and so on is that the graduates who are going out are well recognised, well regarded and are getting jobs. More than 2,500 people graduated from Victoria University this year, the majority with arts majors. And varsity heads believe this is what employers are now looking for. Employers are starting to recognise generic skills from university education rather than just the specific skills in commerce or what have you and it's those generic skills that are very much in demand. But times are tough for many new graduates. Most are heading into a career with a heavy student debt and they need money to tie them over until they find permanent employment. A lot of them at this time of year of course they've um, acquired a lot of debt previous year um, they're trying to live on what they're earning um, right throughout the summer and they also have to save quite a few thousand dollars in order to continue with the tertiary education the next year. More than 4,000 students have registered with the local student job search and 75 percent of them have been placed in a job over the Christmas break. Paula Day Tom, News at 7. Still to come in the News at 7, a shooting in Kilburnie raises fresh concerns about youth gangs. Successful teamwork needs foolproof management and information. That's why the Auckland Warriors chose Tico as the supplier of their computer network. From sophisticated business solutions to the latest in home multimedia, connection to the internet, notebook computers and mobile office systems, Tico delivers. Tico, unsurpassed in equipment, expertise, support and warranties. Put the winning team on your side. For your nearest Tico computer dealer, call Tico toll-free on 0800 658 326. Whether it's a little or a house lot, at Specialist Floors you'll always save on top quality. Vinyls from $29.95, wool carpet from $85, Specialist Floors Upper Hut, open Thursday and Friday, Saturday mornings or any time by appointment. Penny Farthing Cycles, 89 Courtney Place and 109 Queens Drive, Lower Hut. Unique Christmas gift ideas. Beautifully crafted. Reasonably priced. Discover something special this Christmas at Sherazard Silks, Level 1, Capital on the Key. Would you choose something that Alison wouldn't? Alison's choice. Maybe it's your choice too.
time is a great time to call anywhere inside New Zealand with Clear. And if you join Clear tonight, here's something for you. Join Clear before midnight tonight and you'll receive 10% off your first three bills. Call now. This offer is only available tonight. Precise handling. A smooth, unruffled ride. The effortless response of an all new 3 litre V6. And the security of ABS braking. It's a powerful reminder of why you love driving. Rosny Pork Products on Haywards Hill Road. Delicious farm fresh pork, ham, bacon, salami. And we still cure the old fashioned way in Manuka smoke. Rosny Pork, buy direct from the farm or call 235 6329 and we'll deliver. More concerns about youth gangs in our region today. It comes after a group of youths apparently shot at a passing motorist in Kilburnie late last night. Paul Day Tom has been investigating. A gunshot in Kilburnie last night as Wellington police cracked down on the growing number of crimes committed by youths in the region. At about 11 o'clock last night at the Tirangi Road and Coote Street intersection, a group of more than 10 youths allegedly fired a slug gun at a passing motorist. The motorist came away unharmed, but police are now appealing to the public for more information as they battle a growing epidemic of petty and gang-related crime. We have street robberies where you get three or four of them will stand over somebody who's um, sort of in a reasonably isolated part of town, take um, you know, their shoes, jackets, um, you know, particularly if they're of a particular brand that's popular at the time. So once again, you can, there's, there's a wide range of motives in terms of what, they, what they're taking. Figures show during the school holiday breaks, youth crime increases by a third. Police say their hands are tied. The youths are often working for local gangs, some as young as 10. They can only be detained for a short while, and once they're released, they'll offend again. We're pretty insistent they get pretty tight curfew conditions, and we check up and sort of at their home addresses to see whether or not they're actually uh, at home at particular times. If they're not, then we bring them before the court and, um, and hopefully keep them in custody, although that's somewhat difficult to do. Wellington Police now plan to step up their inner city and suburb patrols all in a bid to keep the youths off the street and stop the crimes they're committing. Paula Day Tom, News at 7. The Karori Wildlife Sanctuary will soon be a reality, and in the latest step towards that goal, a visitor's centre is being opened tonight. The sanctuary is unique in that it's returning land inside a major city to its natural state. Veronica Lysart has this progress report. Nestled in the bush on the edge of Karori is the reservoir, and now a visitor's centre. It's a major step towards making the Karori Wildlife Sanctuary a reality. We're now in business. You know, we've got a place, we've got a home, and uh, we can now start showing people around the project, introducing them to it properly. And I suppose it's the culmination of about two or three years' work. Jim Lynch says the site is the same size as Manor Island and hopes to return the valley to the way it was before Europeans arrived. The public can already visit the top of the dam in the narrow valley, but are locked out from the lower reservoir. Because it's still a restricted water supply area, this, um, we'll be offering people guided tours and we estimate that one uh, guide would take about 12 people per tour and we'll just offer as many as there is demand for. He expects several thousand visitors over the summer and at the same time he's trying to keep some creatures out. We'll now try to isolate um, this ecosystem from pests and um, invasion from predators and browsers. And we'll do that through uh, a fence, uh, a predator and browser proof Light fence. The capital cost of developing the sanctuary is $8.5 million dollars over the next five years. Um, the opening of the visitor centre marks an important yeah. step in the development of the Karori Sanctuary. And from the beginning of next year, you'll be able to take guided walks in the lower reservoir. Veronica Lysart, News 7.
Quartz Hill near Makara could be the site of our region's first wind farm. ECNZ is buying land there and says one possibility is a joint venture with the local power supplier Capital Power. The corporation is also interested in sites in the Manawatu and the Tararuas. A proposed energy direct wind farm at Bering Head is looking increasingly unlikely as it faces resource consent problems. Meanwhile, Wairarapa Electricity is working on setting up a wind farm near Martinborough. To international news, it's being described as a landmark for peace. The treaty bringing peace to war-torn Bosnia has finally been signed today. President Clinton was the principal guest, his team drove the settlement negotiations, and he's just won congressional approval to make the largest troop contribution to enforcing it. But President Chirac insisted that a European war should formally be ended on European soil. So, in the civilized elegance of a Parisian mansion, Europe tried to turn its back on the savagery which had been unleashed in the Balkans. The presidents of Serbia, Croatia and Bosnia signed the agreement before heads of government, an assembly from 50 nations and international organizations. The speeches of the three Balkan presidents reflected the damage done by the long war. President Izabegovic, referring to his dream of a multi-ethnic Bosnia, said he felt he was drinking a bitter but useful medicine. President Tudjman spoke of Croatia's aim of associating with the European community. And President Milosevic, too, hinted that Serbia had been an outcast long enough. As to the implementation of the peace agreement and the role of the International Peace Force, the key of the success of its mission is even-handedness, just as a partiality is the key of failure. Even-handedness is the basis on which the entire Dayton Agreement is rested. But those who must enforce the peace and pay for it are insisting that there are limits to what they can do. No one outside can guarantee that Muslims, Croats, and Serbs in Bosnia will come together and stay together as free citizens in a united country sharing a common destiny. Only the Bosnian people can do that. The ceremony clears the way for NATO, but the troops will be just a temporary presence. If the agreement is to stick, then the Balkan leaders will have to make it work themselves. Police dogs and their handlers from around the country have been at Trentham Racecourse this week, taking part in national championships. Alistair Wilkinson was there. A criminal on the run, but not for long, as police dog Drop Baz does his duty back. and stops him in his tracks. This time, it's a reenactment for the National Police Dog Championships, but officers say in real life, the dogs are invaluable. They provide a resource that humans don't have. Uh, obviously, their nose is their most uh, brilliant thing. Um, and, they're, and they're akin to uh, a camera for the photographer or the fingerprint kit for the fingerprint detection. Technician. Seven of the country's top dogs brought their handlers to Wellington this week for the competition, designed to test their skill in police work. A competitive environment where enthusiasm occasionally gets out of hand. Shit! Shit! New Zealand police dogs are trained to go for the arm of an offender, unlike American dogs who'll bite all over. For the handler, the relationship with a dog is one of love. It's a relationship that, that's obviously got to be very, very strong. Um, all the handlers have, have terrific uh, affinity with their dogs. And, um, and we work as a team. We're, we're a 50-50 uh, mix. Despite uh, demands that, that they don't build uh, big relationships, they do. They become another member of the family. Uh, and on those uh, tragic occasions when we lose a dog, it's, uh, it's suffered by all the family. Memorials to dogs who have been lost at the entrance to the police dog training school at Trentham. A reminder the work they do for the force puts them, as well as their handlers, in constant danger of attack. Alastair Wilkinson, News at 7. Before we go to the break, many people are wondering how much better off they'll be after the tax cuts announcement was followed by a call for higher interest rates. Well, News at 7 cartoonist Harold Crimp has his view of the issue.
Your business should get to know this card. More Wilson's Cash. Give a photograph this Christmas from Photography by Wolf. Welcome back now to Williams and Adams Sports. Well, New Zealand has made a bad start to one day cricket series against Pakistan and Wellington and the Hutt Valley are the favourites for the national fast pitch softball finals. With those stories and a preview of other weekend sport, here's Capital City's Ron Snowden. Good evening to you. Straight off their cricket test loss against Pakistan, the New Zealanders again struggled as the one-day series started today at Dunedin. Memories of the World Cup with Deepak Patel taking the new ball, although not with instant success. And he'll get four. Amir Sahail excelled in the test, but Patel ensured he didn't last anywhere near as long today. He's got it. Ijaz was trapped by Gavin Larson. Oh, big shot for leg before he's given. But then there was more cause to recall the World Cup as Inza Mamal Huck attacked oh, the Kiwi that bowlers. Away. That's a good shot, and it's six runs. It's over. That was something of an exception, though, as Chris Cairns... He's bowling. And then Canterbury teammate Nathan Astle halted Pakistan's run Mamal chase. Huck. He's thrashed at that one, and he's gone. Adam Perori accounted for two more with brilliant acrobatics in the field. It's a short, it's a direct hit, and he's run out. And Waka Yunus was the last wicket to fall. The first for Danny Morrison. He's bowling. Oh, stop. As Pakistan struggled to 189 for nine. The run chase started as more of a crawl for New Zealand in trouble immediately thanks to an incredible in catch. Air. Gone. Yes, caught. Nathan Astle's much talked about form deserted him. Is he gone? What a catch. Was he Just when Stephen Fleming was looking to pick up the pace. Certainly he was undone by Waka Yunus. Big shot and Fleming is out. And Brian Young undid himself. Bowling. But Adam Perori had no chance against the perfect Yorker. Bowling. To give Waka figures of three for eight. Roger Twos and Chris Cairns were again thrown together for a rescue mission and hinted at doing the job. But when Cairns fell to Mushtaq... That's a beauty, and he's on his way, Cairns, he's walked. And Captain Lee Jamon followed close behind. Edge. The Kiwis were again in disarray at 114 for eight. With the battling Roger Twos and Wellington teammate Gavin Larson together, there was renewed hope as they closed to within 25 runs of victory. Oh, and Roger Twos brings up 50. But when Larson went, that was effectively it. He's gone. Twos's valiant effort, not enough. Foley. And the uh, Wellington cricket selectors have dropped four players for the next round of the Shell Cup. Out go, out of form top order batsmen, Stephen Mather and John Aiken, former Otago player Ian Billcliffe and the all-rounder Lincoln Dool. Spin bowler Brett Williams comes back into the side, as does another former Otago batsman, Scott McCarty. They'll be joined, of course, by Wellington internationals Gavin Larson and Roger Twos. Roger Twos, another 50 today, three in a row for New Zealand. Wellington and the Hutt Valley are favourites for the national men's fast pitch softball final.